hello and welcome back. So the last few times when I discussed decoupling capacitors, I looked at why you need a minimum value of capacitance and also why it's important to have multiple values of different capacitors. Now if you haven't seen those videos, I will leave some links in the description. Now today, I want to look into a bit more detail on the multiple values of capacitors in parallel topic. And in particular, I want to look at how you can make things go completely wrong by this approach. Let me show you an example. So what I got here is a little board on which I have a signal coming from the signal generator. And this is supplying three capacitors. First, a single electrolytic capacitor, then a single ceramic capacitor, and then the two capacitors in parallel. And I'm supplying this with a 2.5 megahertz sine wave. So basically, I built three low pass filters here. Now, if we look at what happens, so if we look on the ceramic capacitor only, we see that we have around 10 millivolts of signal. If we look on the electrolytic capacitor only, again, roughly 10 millivolts of signal. Now, if we look on the two capacitors in parallel, normally we would be expecting less than 10 millivolts. But what do we get? Well, we get almost double that. We have around 18 to 19 millivolts of signal. So for whatever reason, putting these two capacitors in parallel makes them behave as a worse filter than if you would use each of them on their own. So if you're curious what's going on and how to prevent this sort of effect, then keep watching. So to get a better understanding of what's going on, we need to remember what the equivalent model of a capacitor is. So let's start off by looking at some simulations in LT spice, of course. So if we simulate the impedance of a standalone capacitor that just has capacitance, so an ideal capacitor, we see that its impedance drops with the increasing frequency. So I'm plotting here a voltage, but the impedance is voltage divided by current. Current is one, so this also represents the impedance. Now in real life, of course, this is not how a capacitor behaves. I've looked at that in a different video. How the capacitor behaves can be explained by this sort of model. So we have, other than the capacitance, some extra series resistance and some series inductance. And the impedance of this sort of structure looks something like this. So the capacitor has a mainly capacitive behavior for a certain amount of frequency. Afterwards, it has a purely inductive behavior. And then in between, the capacitor and the inductor go into resonance and their impedance is only limited by the series resistance. And that's how we get this V sort of shape. Now, depending on the capacitor, the values of these parasitics will be different, the value of the capacitance will be different. So I did here also a one microfarad capacitor, and this has a similar behavior. So it's also this V shape, but it's shifted to the side. Now, the question comes, what happens when you put these two capacitors in parallel? What will be the equivalent impedance of the sum of them? Well, you might think it will be the minimum of the two. And if we look at how they behave, well, you're sort of right, but only in certain frequency ranges. So where the first capacitor was purely capacitive, the sum of the two has a lower impedance than each of them on their own. Where both capacitors were inductive, again, the impedance, the sum of the impedances is lower than the two components taken on their own. But here in the middle, we have a bit in which everything goes horribly wrong. So here we can see at around 110 kilohertz, that the impedance of the two capacitors in parallel is far worse than any of the capacitors left on their own. Basically, we have an anti-resonance. And this is exactly the phenomenon that we saw in our practical board. Now, the reason why this is happening is related to how the two capacitors behave on their own. So if we look at the blue line, so the 10 microfarad capacitor, we can see that by the time it reaches 110 kilohertz, it's a purely inductive component. So we can see this also from the phase shift. So it's a an almost perfectly 90 degrees phase shift at this frequency. Whereas the second capacitor, the one microfarad one, so the green line, at this point, it's still a purely capacitive component. So you can see in its phase shift that it's very close to minus 90 degrees. So basically where these two impedance graphs meet, 
we have an inductor in parallel with a capacitor. Basically, a resonant LC circuit. And that is exactly what's causing our anti-resonance. The two components, one behaving like an inductor, the other like a capacitor, interact, forming another resonant frequency. And of course, this is something that we do not want. So what can we do? Well, we can combine multiple capacitors. For example, if we add an extra 100 nanofarad capacitor to the mix, we make things even worse. So other than our initial anti-resonance, we have a second anti-resonance. Because at this point, our 100 nanofarad capacitor is interacting with our 1 microfarad capacitor to lead to yet another one of these anti-resonance frequencies. So adding multiple capacitors in parallel can have disastrous consequences for specific frequencies. So what do we do if we don't want this? Well, a common rule of thumb is to have capacitors in parallel, so this is something that you will see in practice, it's not like you're not allowed to do it, but you should be careful of what the ratio of capacitances is between the components. Basically what you want is at the frequency where the two impedance graphs meet, you don't want to have a purely inductive and a purely capacitive component, but you want something that's very close to a resistive component. To achieve that, you need to have small capacitance differences. So for example, if we look at this setup, so I have a 10 microfarad capacitor and a 1 microfarad, but there's also a 3.3 microfarad in between, so we have 3 times more than the 1 microfarad and 3 times the 3.3 is 10 microfarads. If we look at this, so let's just compare this to the 10 microfarad and the 1 microfarad setup, we're still getting anti-resonances, but this time they're much, much smaller. So by adding this extra 3.3 microfarad capacitor, we added another resonance point, we got two anti-resonances, but the whole system has an overall lower impedance. And it has this lower impedance on the wider frequency range. So of course, we can go one step further, add another extra capacitor. So what I got here is capacitors that double in value. So 1 microfarad, 2.2, 4.7, and then 10. And if we look at this setup, well, again, we have an extra resonance point, an extra anti-resonance point, but again, the overall impedance is lower. So our anti-resonance points are at lower frequencies than before. Now, of course, based on the actual components used, this will look a bit better or a bit worse. So now let's look at the simulation of the circuit that we actually measured. So I have here my AC signal in series with a 50 ohm resistor and only the polymer electrolytic capacitor. I took a model from a manufacturer of this sort of component. Then I have the same thing with only a ceramic capacitor. Here I have the model based on a TDK datasheet. So based on this, it's a simpler model, but it does the job. And finally, I have the two elements combined. So if we look at this, we see the impedance of the polymer capacitor it's not as sharp, it's not a clear V, and that's because this sort of capacitor has quite a lot of ESR, so equivalent series resistance. If we compare this to the ceramic capacitor, here the impedance curve is much, much more clear. And if we look at the combined response, so the two components in parallel, we see our anti-resonance appearing. But unlike our measurement, rather than being at 2.5 megahertz, the simulator is telling us it's at around 6. And there's two reasons for this. First of all, the components that I'm simulating are not exactly the components that I have in real life. I don't really have the exact order code, so I don't really know what components I have. I just took some very similar components. And secondly, my simulation is not taking one very important element into account. The way in which I made my board. So. If we look closely at how the board is built, we see that, well, I was too lazy to make a proper layout for it, and that means that I used some very thin, long wires to interconnect the components. And these wires are adding extra inductance. So if we look at the same circuit, but add an extra, say, six nanohenries of inductance to the capacitor, so six nanohenries can easily be obtained with a few millimeters of wire, we see that we get a very nice anti-resonance very close to 2.5 megahertz. 
So basically, whatever inductance the capacitor had, I added this extra 6 nanohenry on top. So I'm creating a much better resonance circuit with my ceramic capacitor. So other than being careful at what exact values you're using for your capacitors when you're putting them all in parallel, you also need to take care of your layout parasitics. So other than the component parasitics, you can add extra problems by making a bad layout. Now, speaking of parasitics, for this experiment, I specifically wanted a polymer aluminum capacitor, rather than a standard aluminum electrolytic capacitor. And the reason for that is that this sort of capacitor has a special property of having very low ESR. So if we look into the datasheet of such a capacitor, a 6.3 volt capacitor at 220 microfarads has an ESR of around 22 milliohms. This is the capacitor for which I have the model in the simulation. Now, if we look at a similar type of capacitor that's not a polymer electrolytic, so this is a standard aluminum electrolytic, now there's no 6.3 volt capacitor in this datasheet, but the 10 volt capacitor at 220 microfarads has an ESR of 200 milliohms, and this is only at 20 degrees. If we go to negative temperatures, it can get far, far worse. So now if we go back to the simulation, and rather than adding extra inductance, we add extra resistance to the electrolytic capacitor. So I added an extra 200 milliohms to it. So I didn't change the model or anything. I just added this ESR. And we look at the response. Well, we see that there's no more anti-resonance. And that's because the capacitor together with this extra ESR has a much poorer impedance, but that means that it's resistive for a much wider frequency range. So where this capacitor starts to interact with the ceramic capacitor, it's basically a resistive element interacting with a capacitive element. So no problem. So usually when you'll be using standard aluminum electrolytic capacitors in parallel with ceramic capacitors, you won't really have issues. But in general, creating rules of thumb for this sort of situations is quite difficult because each component will be different than the other and only by looking at the exact parameters of the components that you're using, will you be able to determine whether you have an anti-resonance problem or not. And speaking of anti-resonances, usually you don't want to have them, but if you do end up having them, it's a good idea to try to make sure that your circuit doesn't really generate noise at that particular frequency. So if the noise in your circuit is always above or always below this point of anti-resonance, then you don't really have a problem. So when putting capacitors in parallel, make sure that there's not much of a capacitance difference between them, make sure your layout is nice and tidy so you don't have extra inductances added, and be careful with the extra series resistance. So all in all, hope you got some useful information out of this, leave your thoughts in the comments, thank you for watching, make sure to subscribe to be up to date with all my latest videos, and see you next time, bye bye.